Hey everyone, this is going to be my virtual 20 to 25 minute talk on my paper, Embodied Visual Navigation with Automatic Curriculum Learning in Real Environments. Embodied AI is learning through doing. The idea here is that you give artificial agents a body and they learn through interaction with the world. So there's a lot of applications like self-driving cars, assistive robots at home and in public spaces, um, or just general repetitive and physical tasks such as warehouse logistics. One of the core challenges of embodied AI is navigation. Once we have reliable ways to train navigation agents, we can train them end to end with other tasks like grasping. The end product is agents that interact better and therefore are able to learn more about our world. Our focus is on embodied navigation. Using only RGB images, to target objects, for example, a football or a vase, these are specified semantically. Uh, and we want an approach that generalizes across targets, uh, generalized to new scenes, as well as from simulation to the real world, a property we call sim to real. We have two main contributions. One is bridging the sim to real gap. And in doing so, we have this benefit called zero shot semantic navigation, which I'll describe later. And we also contribute to automatic curriculum learning for navigation. Previous navigation approaches tend not to transfer well from simulation to the real world. And there's many reasons for this, but two of the ones we decided to tackle are collision exploitation and then the visual differences between simulators and the real world. So let's start with collision exploitation. This is where agents will exploit collision mechanics by sliding along obstacles. So here I have a video from Facebook's um, paper called Solving Point Goal Navigation. And in this case, we're gonna see the agent navigate to the goal. And each time the agent collides with the wall, you'll see a red border appear around the frame. So you can see here, it's sliding along the wall, slides along the wall again, slides along the bed, finally reaches a goal. So you can see there's a lot of uh, collision exploitation from these agents. Unsurprisingly, when we take these policies and we try to apply them to the real world, um, we see that they don't work very well. Here we can see an agent trained similar to Facebook's agent as it attempts to slide along the wall. Now let's back up and talk about the second issue. This is the divergence between uh, simulator perception and real world perception. So one of the issues here is that simulators are not perfect. Uh, they have lots of artifacts. So if you try and learn concepts like depth and simulation, they're not always going to transfer to the real world. And we can actually look at some of these scenes that we train on and see some of these artifacts. So here we have a floating mesh. Here we have this lamp that has gotten merged with the wall behind it. Over here on the right, you can see we have messed up textures. Uh, we have holes in our meshes, discontinuities, um, reflections, uh, all sorts of artifacts that will confuse our agents. So this brings us back to our first contribution, which is in simtrial transfer. Our vision issue is tackled using frozen feature networks or FFNs. Um, and in doing so, we get this nice property called zero shot semantic navigation, where we can navigate to never before seen objects and even semantic classes. We tackle the collision issue with reward shaping. But it turns out that fixing the collision issue causes a new issue called reward sparsity. So this chart here at the bottom, we have the 2019 CVPR Embodied Navigation Challenge winner. And when we allow it to do its thing in a regular environment, allow it to slide on walls, we get this blue line here. You can see it learns very quickly. When we disallow it from colliding, when we end the episode and give it a negative reward upon collision, you can see here we get this orange line uh, where the agent does not really learn in a, a respectable amount of time. We mitigate this issue of reward sparsity using something called automatic curriculum learning or ACL. ACL is the automatic ordering and selection of training data. And the idea here is to improve the sample efficiency as well as the generality of a trained model. It brings us to our second contribution, NAV ACL which is an ACL framework specifically for navigation agents. This chart shows how all of our contributions fit together, and we're going to be jumping back to this chart every time I move between sections. Let's start with reward shaping. 
So this is our reward function, and there's quite a few terms here, but really the important one is simply a negative binary reward for collision. So this ensures that our agent no longer wants to collide with the environment. Jumping back, let's talk about our frozen feature networks. Our frozen feature networks are convolutional neural networks that are trained only on real images. Uh, our networks output spatial and semantic features. And the gradient uh, during policy learning does not actually pass through these frozen feature networks, hence the term frozen. The weights are frozen. They do not change from gradient descent. Um, and those are denoted here with these little orange X's that stop gradient propagation. This has two main uh, benefits. First, it speeds up policy convergence, so because we don't actually have to learn uh, these spatial and semantic features, they're pre-trained. And it also prevents overfitting to simulation artifacts, which I'll describe in the next slide. The key here is that simulation artifacts don't exist in the real world spatial latent space. So our spatial networks are trained only on real images. So these things like floating meshes or bad textures are lost during this mapping from sim to latent space. So you can see the doors get filled in, the textures go away, and floating meshes don't exist in the real world. And the key here is that the frozen feature network simply never learned to represent these sort of buggy, um, unrealistic, uh, images. And so this helps to enhance the sim to real transfer. Our semantic network is pre-trained on real images as well. This allows us to decouple the input image from the target we're navigating to. And this allows for this term I coined earlier, zero-shot semantic navigation. It allows us to find never before seen instances of the same target so over here on the left, we can train on this specific vase, and we can navigate to any one of these vases, having never seen them before. But even more interestingly, we can actually swap the target label at runtime to find targets the agent has never seen before. So we can actually train on a football and then navigate to a completely different semantic class, like a vase. Okay. Now we're done talking about frozen feature networks. Let's start talking about NAV ACL. This is our automatic curriculum learning framework. There are some previous ACL methods for navigation and I won't get too uh, in depth here, but suffice to say that they're not ideal for our situation. The way NAV ACL works is it filters down a set of training tasks based on agent ability, and this fosters more stable learning. We'll start with a couple of definitions. We have S0, this is the start pose of our agent. SG, this is the location that our agent is trying to navigate to. Um, a start and a goal compose a task H. We're training navigation policy pi. And we have F pi star of H. And this is simply the probability of our policy pi solving a task H, specific task H. Um, so how likely is it that our policy can navigate from S0 to SG? We estimate F pi star, the task success probability, using a fully connected neural network we call F pi. To make F pi seen invariant, we take our tasks H and we pre-process them into geometric measures before each forward pass. And this is simply because some coordinate X, Y, Z in scene one bears no correspondence to a coordinate X, Y, Z in scene two. So this allows NAVACL to generalize across scenes and even to new scenes that it has not seen before. Our policy improves over time, and we want to ensure that the tasks we're selecting for our policy are relevant. We use something called adaptive filtering to update the task distribution in step with the policy. Here's where we define adaptive filtering. We have the set of all tasks, big H. We sample tasks, little h, from the task space, big H. We push them through our neural network, and we simply fit a normal distribution to the results. Once we have our normal distribution, we can categorize our tasks. We can select easy tasks to prevent catastrophic forgetting. So this is where our task success probability is higher than the mean plus some standard deviation. So we're more likely to succeed on these tasks, therefore they're easier. Similarly, we have frontier or medium tasks to provide consistent learning signal. And you can see these are bounded near the mean, right? So these are going to be medium difficulty tasks.
And then finally, we have random tasks. And this is to ensure that our policy is not overfitting to the tasks we're generating, our easy and frontier tasks. It also has a nice um, property that in the limit, we will expose our agent to all possible tasks. I realize the past few slides may have not been super clear. So here's a more intuitive example of what we're doing. Uh, we have a plot here. We have success probability on the x-axis and the training time step on the y-axis. So you can see initially, our agent is not succeeding on many of the tasks. It's not doing very well. So we start sampling and over time, we see our policy begins to improve. All NavACL is doing here is shifting these frontier and easy task categories along with the policy to ensure that we're always selecting appropriate tasks for our policy. We train FPI, our task success probability estimator using a forward pass in blue and a backwards pass in red. During the forwards pass, we simply sample tasks from FPI and we play them out, creating episodes or rollouts. Once you've collected enough episodes, we can do a backwards pass. First, we follow what any reinforcement learning algorithm would do, and we do gradient descent on our episodes and we update our policy network. However, we can use these same exact episodes that we've just used to update our policy network to update NavACL. So we can basically update NavACL for free. There's very little overhead in doing this update. We don't have to do any extra episodes or anything of that sort. Now we're done talking about NavACL, let's jump to our policy network. What's going on here? Well, we have spatial and semantic features coming into our policy network. So first we take these and we stack and compress them to a more compact representation using a convolutional neural network. This compact representation is then fed into our long short-term memory, LSTM cells, uh, which allow our agent to remember previously explored areas, and it keeps the deep reinforcement learning Markov assumptions valid. From the LSTM, we split into two heads, the actor head and the critic head, and we optimize our entire policy network using proximal policy optimization, or PPO. Now let's talk about our experiments. We've done four experiments. First, we evaluate NAVACL. Then we study our policy against state of the art. We do a more in-depth simulation policy evaluation. And then we take our policies trained in simulation and we evaluate them in the real world. In our NAVACL study, we compare NAVACL to random task sampling. This is a simulator default used in the CVPR challenges. We have five trials. Each trial has 5 million training time steps and we're training and validating on the same single scene. We find that policies trained with NAVACL greatly outperform the standard. So this is NAVACL, this is uniform sampling. What is NAVACL actually doing behind the hood? Well, let's look at one of these geometric measures. The one we're looking at here is geodesic task distance. This is simply the separation from start to goal. And intuitively, you would imagine that as our agent gets better at navigation, it can tackle longer tasks. And this is what we see here. Over time, as our agent improves, NAVACL increases the distance between the start and goal. Now let's compare our policy trained with NAVACL against the state of the art. So we compare our NAVACL trained policy with the 2019 CVPR Habitat Embodied Agent Challenge winner. Similar to the last experiment, we have five trials, five million training time steps per trial, and we are training and testing on a single scene. We have two distinct setups. In the first setup, we allow collision in the training and testing environment, so our agent is allowed to slide along walls. And in the second setup, we fail on collision um, in the training and testing environments, as well as provide a negative reward. The metric we use is shortest path length. This is the standard for embodied navigation, uh, and this corresponds to zero if our agent never reaches the target, and one for a, the shortest possible path to the target. So if we look at the dotted lines, ours in orange and theirs in blue, you'll notice that even in an environment where we allow collisions, we still outperform the 2019 CVPR champions. But what's more interesting is if we look at the solid lines, this is where we stop the agent from colliding with the environment. The blue line, the 2019 CVPR champion, is unable to learn in 5 million training time steps. However, our solid orange line, shows that we are able to learn in these environments. In fact, we don't even take that large of a performance hit if we compare our solid orange line to our dotted orange line. We have a, a performance hit of maybe 0.1 SPL when we stop our agent from colliding with the environment. So we showed that our policy can beat state of the art. Now let's evaluate our policy more thoroughly across multiple environments and see how it can generalize. 
We train on 70 distinct scenes, and then we test on 30 tasks over three never before seen scenes. We train the policies for 20 million training time steps, and because these policies are stochastic, we compare 10 attempts. And we compare 10 attempts of each of the following policies. We have a random policy where we simply sample random actions. We have nav ACL zero shot, where our agent has been trained on a football and during test time, it is navigating to a base. We have nav ACL, where we've trained on a football and we're navigating to a football. And then we finally have 10 distinct human operators who played through the entire same training set and then test set as our agents. These are the results of our simulation. We see that the random policies tend not to perform very well. What's interesting is if you look at some other papers, you'll see SPLs as high as 0.2 to 0.3 for the random agents. And this is simply because sampling random actions will eventually get you near a wall where you have some probability of sampling a forward action, which allows you to slide around the outside of the environment and eventually reach the target that way. This doesn't actually work in the real world, and you can see it doesn't work in our collision-free test environment either. If we compare nav ACL zero shot to nav ACL, we see there's a negligible performance hit. But this is something that we'd be willing to take if it means you can navigate to never before seen objects or semantic classes, which is a very powerful form of navigation. As you can see on never before seen environments, we are not yet at the level of human operators. However, if you look more closely, you'll see that for some environments, the mean performance is within one standard deviation of human performance, which shows us that our agents are beating some humans some of the time. So far, all of our experiments have been in simulation. What happens when we take that policy we just trained and we put it on a robot in the real world? We did seven autonomous ground vehicle tests across three scenes. One AGV test was on a never before seen object, and one AGV test was on a completely new semantic class. We also did two UAV tests across two distinct scenes. These are the real world results from our autonomous ground vehicle tests. Uh, we have the name of the scene. We have the target we're navigating to. Note that we always trained on a football. So during test time, we can navigate to footballs, we can navigate to different types of footballs, or even completely different semantic classes. Over here, we have the separation from start to goal, how far the task is. And then we have the last column, the resulting SPL that our real world agent was able to achieve. So now I'm going to show you a video of our zero shot semantic navigation case where we navigate to a never before seen target. So over here on the left, we have the input RGB image of the agent. We have the two spatial features, depth and reshading. And we finally have the semantic feature. The agent is over here in the scene, as you can see. You'll notice we even put previous semantic targets here to confuse the agent, uh, which did not confuse it because we we're able to swap out the target label at runtime. And notice we have challenging lighting conditions. We have dark, we have glare, we have overexposure. You can see here the agent has detected the target and makes a beeline towards it. Our policies were trained for a specific ground robot, but we wanted to see what happened if we took our policies and we put them on a drone. Now keep in mind this drone has completely different camera intrinsics and it also has an extra dimension, Z, height, that it varies in over time. Let's see what happens. Here, we're not actually searching for a target. We're simply looking at our policy search strategy and to see if we can navigate successfully without bumping into things. You'll notice that our agent's flight is completely collision free, even though our agent was never trained on a drone before. You'll also notice that it has a reasonably good search strategy. It looks at all the cubicles and through all the offices and makes its way down the building. So to conclude, our agents are able to generalize to new targets, new environments, and surprisingly even new mobility platforms. We were able to help bridge the SimTorial gap using frozen feature networks and collision avoidance. 
Finally, we use NaviCL to drastically improve the training efficiency and make all this possible. Where can we go from here? Well, we can think about building a unifying model for different types of mobility and perception platforms. We can investigate more structured, longer-term spatial memory, or we can even think about using multitask agents. So instead of just the navigation task, we can think about navigation and pointing task, or navigation and grasping tasks together. And finally, how can we make this a cooperative problem? How can we take multiple different agents and train them to communicate and search for targets together? And that's all I've got. Thanks for listening to my talk.